Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 195 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book, From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing, is available now on Amazon. Just came out a few weeks ago. Make sure you go out and pick that up. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, as a New Yorker who moved to Tennessee in 2012, reading emotional cues in other people quickly became a very important skill for me in the workplace. In working with my new team, I saw one person push his chair backwards as I was critical about his job performance. And I realized that being a blunt New Yorker might be okay in New York, but I would need to cool it a bit in the state of Tennessee, or I would find myself quickly without a team. So I promise you that these conversations that we're gonna be having today on emotional intelligence and emotional cues, these are gonna be very important for you and your career long-term. So I can't wait to jump into it. Now, today we have with us Dr. Bar Barbara Kerr, having identified the skills of emotional intelligence as highly significant to the success and well-being of individuals, teams, and organizations, Barbara has provided coaching, workshops, online courses, and presentations in emotional intelligence for people in business, education, healthcare, and also nonprofits. In addition to earning her doctorate in English as serving as a college instructor, Barbara has completed a postgraduate training course as a master certified executive coach and is a certified administrator of the EQI 2.0, which is an emotional intelligence inventory, as well as a number of other assessments to assess individuals, teams, and organizations in moving forward to fulfill their vision. She is the author of a workbook based on the online course. It's called Emotional Intelligence for a Compassionate World, Workbook for Enhancing Emotional Intelligence Skills, which is available on Amazon.com right now on print or in Kindle editions. I think this is going to be fantastic for all of our student listeners. Welcome to the show, Barbara. Thank you so much, Michael. Do you, do you prefer to be called Mike? Yeah, Mike is fine. I mean, usually uh, Michael, my parents are really the only ones that call me <laughs> Michael. So Mike would be just fine. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be on. I'm really excited to talk with you and your audience about emotional intelligence. I, it's a passion of mine. I know you're very <laughs> passionate about it. So I said, I need to go to the author. We're going to go straight to the source. I think it's important for our listeners to get to know you a little bit, just on a personal level. I know you decided on Temple University for your educational pursuits. I'm wondering, why was Temple in Philadelphia the right choice for you? Okay, I, I'm from New Jersey, and so I'm very familiar with that Eastern thing as well. I've lived in California and Washington a long time. But I, I was a kid when I came to Philadelphia, fresh out of college at Penn State. I, I graduated mid-year. And my fiance was at Temple Dental School. I knew nothing about Philadelphia. You know, Penn State is out in the middle of the state. Uh, you know, that, that was my bubble. So I, I applied to Temple uh, for graduate school in English. And I, I was teaching uh, part-time, or not part-time, temporary teaching. And Temple wrote to me and said, yes, you're accepted. I was like, oh, great. But I didn't have the money. I was getting married. My parents weren't gonna pay anymore. They, they said, after college, that's it, okay. So I wrote back to Temple and said, I, you know, I was, I'm very interested, but I can't do it right now. Can you hold a place for me? They wrote back with a full fellowship. A fellowship is better than a scholarship. I got tuition, I got books, and I got a stipend, which we largely lived on for the next several years as I was a student and my husband continued as a student. So, um, and Temple turned out to be a wonderful place for me. I had wonderful professors, uh, it was mid-city, and I got to later teach as a teaching assistant there, and it was a great place. Now I can see why you're so passionate about Temple. They really did an amazing thing for you and for your family. So that's uh, that's wonderful. I love the students there. I actually spoke there earlier this semester and I just had such a fantastic experience. I love the students there, a uh, huge fan, have a wonderful fraternity and sorority system. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad that uh, obviously you had a great experience as well. So that's really, really wonderful. Now yeah. you are the author of a well-received self-paced workbook for adults. It's called Emotional Intelligence for a compassionate world. So I'm, one, I'm wondering, what made you want to put together this particular workbook? 
Okay, well, along my career path, which as you have pointed out, has a lot of parts to it, you know, a writer, also a novelist. I've written several novels, um, not all published, um, a tenured college English instructor, a consultant, a coach, and of uh, course, facilitator. I came to recognize the importance of emotional intelligence. Um, when I learned about emotional intelligence, I thought this is a wonderful lens to see the world through. Um, and I think it's important for individuals, for organizations, for our communities, and even for the world. I know that's kind of a, sounds sort of hyperbolic, but I, I truly believe it. I observed that in an organization's environment uh, and the level of EI were often determined from the top. And I know you know what I'm talking about because I heard you uh, when Nicole interviewed you, uh, that you talked about the importance of leaders in college organizations because leaders can greatly influence uh, the mood and environment as well as the decisions that an organization makes. Uh, and leaders, of course, can be anyone. Uh, they don't have to be the, the determined leaders, the people that we elected or whatever, but anyone who can come, come up as a leader uh, can be influential. So I began delivering workshops in emotional intelligence, many of them to college executive teams. In fact, I, I helped hire as a consultant three uh, uh, presidents in the college system in Washington, community college system. Uh, so I gave these workshops, but they were never long enough. People would say, can you give a three hour workshop or a six hour workshop or even a two day workshop? And, and I would, I did the best I could as I'm doing my best in this short presentation, but it's not long enough. Truly becoming emotionally intelligent is a lifelong ongoing process, not an overnight one. So when I was recovering from treatments for cancer and living on Bainbridge Island, this wonderful little island off the coast of Seattle, I sat up in a little tower room that I had built with warm floors, uh, tile, with heated tiles. And I wrote this book to be able to put everything that I wanted to say in those workshops uh, in a book, which I later made into an online uh, course. Um, and that's how I came to write the book. And it, now I can, I can give people the book and say, this is the whole story. That's fantastic. And you're, I'm glad that you had an opportunity to go back and listen to some of the podcasts earlier. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, I look at some of the problems that happen on college campuses today, you know, in the news recently has been sexual assaults happening on college campuses all across the country. And I really believe the tone is set by the leadership in terms of how we're going to treat each other, how we're going to treat other students, how we're going to treat our own members, our guests in our house. And it all comes from leadership. And so I really believe in that. And uh, I believe that fraternity and sorority ultimately is, uh, is the right place to develop those leaders. I think there is no better leadership experience on a college campus outside of fraternity and sorority. So I really believe in it. Obviously it has its problems. There's no question about it when fraternity and sorority is done wrong, but when it's done right, uh, I will tell you, it'll set you up for a lifetime of success. So, uh, but that's fantastic. Yeah, because any organization, it's going to come from the top. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I got so that I could walk into a college, basically, I did a lot of colleges, and I could tell just from how things felt, whether there was emotionally intelligent leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So important. So let's talk a little bit about self awareness. What are the seven questions that you should ask yourself to explore your own self awareness? Okay. First, let me say that I think emotional self-awareness is the absolute foundational piece of emotional intelligence. My model has five aspects. Four of them are very common in all of the, um, all of the models. There are many out there. Basically, self-awareness, always that's part of it. Uh, Self-management, interaction with others, and understanding of others. And, and I add resilience. But self-awareness is the, the foundational aspect. In my book and in my course, I have many exercises and tips. Yeah, I go into this in much more detail. But just to start, I'd like to just give you those seven ways that you can think about your own self-awareness. So one, do I know when I'm looking at a gray situation in black and white? These days, this is an easy one to think about. Any discussion about guns, abortion, uh, political leadership, many of us go to a black or white position. And there's so much we can learn by opening ourselves to the gray areas where we overlap, what we, what we can agree on. And so that's one way to really try to be aware of, am I just standing on my ground because this is what I want people to think I believe, or am I open to listening? Second, 
can I identify physical signs in myself of anger, sadness, frustration, elation, satisfaction, and other emotions? Many people do not really do this. You get a headache, you get a stomach ache, you get butterflies in your stomach, uh, you get a backache, you know, you kind of feel paralyzed, uh, you can't sleep. If you can connect those physical manifestations to how you're feeling, you will become more self-aware. And you can, you can then acknowledge that's, that, that that's what's bothering you. And it really helps. Uh, identifying your emotions is the best way to start managing them, not controlling. I do not use controlling. Managing your emotions, okay? Third, um, can I recognize facial expressions or body language that indicate how people are reacting to my words or behavior? And I'll have a little more to say about that later, but um, very important to be able to watch how people are reacting when you are speaking to them. So um, it could be a, you know, an actual presentation where you're watching an audience uh, or a classroom, but it could also be one-on-one. -on -one. So right now you're kind of, you look like you're listening, you're nodding your head a little bit, you have a slight smile. I know you're listening and I feel like you're okay with what I'm saying. Yeah. And that's what we wanna do. Um, you know, people who go on and on and you know, you're bored and you don't wanna be impolite, but there are signs. You can see when people really don't want you to talk anymore. Um, fourth, do I acknowledge to myself moments of joy, disappointment, sadness, jealousy, uh, contentment, or any other emotions that come up? In my course, one of the first things I teach about self-awareness is, again, the importance of identifying how you feel. And I send people to a website where there are almost 4,000 words in the English language for emotions. We use probably, you can count it yourself today or, or this week, probably 10. And there are many nuanced, wonderful words. And if you can find that, that will lead you to self-awareness. Naming the emotion. Um, I've tried this with little children. I have a, a, a great little granddaughter who's now nine. But even when she was two or three, you're, you're mad, aren't you? You're really mad. You wanted to stay at the playground. It helps, it's like magic because that person is then understood. And it really is lovely. Mm -hmm. Fifth, am I aware of when I'm speaking or behaving defensively? Hey, who left the towels on the bathroom floor? It wasn't me. Okay, often people move right to that defensive thing. The towels on the floor is just a, a kind of easy one. But lots of times in uh, conversation, people just want to defend themselves. And uh, are you one of those people? Ask yourself that. Uh, or is there something you could open to that, yes, you did have something to do with whatever the situation was? Six, can I identify my attitude and intent as I communicate with others? I really like this one. This can include name dropping, uh, impressing others, appearing helpless, um, getting attention uh, or making other people feel less than. Did I mention that I'm a theta? Did I mention that I, I graduated Phi Beta Kappa? Now, those are irrelevant to our conversation. Maybe theta might be. But what am I trying to communicate by that? It's my status. Hey, I was a theta. Hey, I graduated, blah, blah, blah. People drop those little things into their conversation. And you don't have to judge it. It's just to understand, wow, that must be important to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps you understand people and it helps you be more aware that you are doing the same thing. So that's part of self awareness. Uh, once I discovered that, I, I really had to rethink what I said to people. Uh, what am I trying to impress somebody about here? So those are, those are seven quick ways. As I say, there's much more to know about self awareness, but that can, that can be helpful. That could be very helpful. So if you didn't catch all of that, make sure you rewind it, go back and listen to it again, because these are really critical, especially for leaders and student organizations to really understand. I mean, even just, you know, in looking out at my chapter, I remember as chapter president talking to them every week, I could tell a lot from the room just by looking around the room, looking at posture looking at, you know, their facial uh, structure, you know, different things, even how their arms were, you know, sitting. Uh, it, all of these things are kind of clues to try and determine if everybody is with you, if they're understanding where you're going, if they're in support of what it is that you're doing. And if you see something that sticks out, 
hey, maybe it's time to slow down and, and build consensus again. Um, so these are all really, really important things. And yes, being a theta is very important to this conversation. <laughs> so we love thetas on the show. So absolutely, that's very, very important. Now, um, what are some real life scenarios of both what you would consider to be strong and also what you consider to be needs improvement in terms of self-awareness? Okay, great. And I, I like that you're using needs improvement because I don't like to say weaknesses. You know, we can just think of these things that can use, and we can all need, use some improvement. Um, most of my, in my book, I have scenarios for, for all of these different aspects, and a lot of them are work-related or just our personal lives. So I'm trying to adapt a little bit here to, uh, to college students. So uh, after a difficult day of midterm exams, Jonathan meets with his girlfriend Janice at their favorite hangout. They're no sooner seated when he starts fuming about a professor's exam and how unfair it was. Uh, when he finally looks at Janice's face 10 minutes later, he stops, laughs a little at himself, and asks her about her own exams. She had some the same day. Now, uh, another good thing to remember is that we can catch ourselves. That's a great thing. That's being self-aware. Oh, here I am going on and on about my own problems. Uh, you know, typically the story would be a husband or wife who's been working all day comes home and starts complaining to their spouse. Uh, but if you can catch yourself in midstream, that is self-awareness. Uh, needs development. Uh, Dennis, who's going through a difficult time because his girlfriend wants some space, wonders why he's having so much trouble getting to class concentrating, finish an essay, finishing an essay that's overdue. Again, if we can connect our how we're feeling and on any given day with something that's happened, realizing why we have that emotion, it is the first step to managing it. Oh yeah, I'm feeling really kind of put down and lonely and I'm gonna have to face this and do something about it. So that is a needs development. And uh, I have some other scenarios. I don't want to go on too long. You yeah, that's me. really good. Now, I think that helps to kind of frame it up to figure out what's strong, what needs improvement. You know, and as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about uh, the student leaders that are trying to build productive teams, productive fraternities, productive sororities. How can we be more adept at reading some of these emotional cues in other people in order to build a more productive organization? Okay, great. Um, this skill actually falls more under uh, awareness of others and interaction with others. All of the aspects, of course, are intertwined. But other aspects of um, being aware of others' emotions will improve your interactions with them. Well, why should you care? Uh, besides listening well to others, we can increase our ability to read their nonverbal communications. But it takes some practice. My favorite way when I teach this is to tell people to watch their favorite dramatic TV program or movie and be aware of the emotions uh, of nonverbal communications uh, that are uh, what emotions are being communicated. Right now, I've been watching Succession. Or do you watch that, Michael? Do you know? I do oh, not. God. Don't watch it. They're all greedy and totally non-emotionally intelligent, which makes it very interesting. Uh, and they're good actors, um, the, the, the Roy family. So one, you can watch, as you mentioned, posture, body movement, and even stance. Uh, one of the people in that show, Kendall Roy, he's the son of the, the rich guy and they're all rich. Um, his stance is kind of like this all the time. He, he's a wonderful actor who gets into the role and really wants to be that like that person. Facial expression, we're all very uh, you know, aware of that one, I think. However, we don't take the time to really think about those facial expressions and what are they expressing? Eyes, eyes truly are the windows to the soul. When you look at people's eyes, you can learn a lot. Space, now this is somewhat culturally determined. Some people will want to stand closer to you than you're comfortable with. Uh, and again, even from uh, New York to Tennessee and certainly from New York to California, I had to learn when I moved to California and Washington, and by now I am a Westerner, I moved pretty much after, after Temple University. Um, people are so much gentler here and um, they can be really quite shocked by the, uh, the outgoingness and the bluntness of, of Easterners. Yeah. 
So space is a big thing. One time I was coaching an executive and he wanted to be a president. He was very good. He was very intelligent. He had skills, but oh my gosh, he was a big guy, bigger than me. And I'm like five, eight. And he would just stand too close. I had to tell him. And I think it was a helpful clue for him. Another one is simply touch. What's the handshake like? Very often when you go for an interview, people want to shake your hand because they are evaluating on that. Um, hug. There's one character on Succession, a young character who hugs these other characters who are New Yorkers who really don't want to be hugged. And it's so interesting to watch how they're, what they react. Uh, does somebody grab you when they speak to you or pat you? Those are all nonverbal cues. Um, gestures, of course, we're pretty used to whether people, how people gesture. And again, they're culturally determined very often. So if you're speaking to someone from Japan or wherever, you do need to research that a little bit. But those are signals to how we're feeling. And finally, voice, the timing and pace and volume, the tone, inflection, and actually even the words that we use for agreement. Sometimes people say, I see, or oh, I got it, I understand. Or on succession, uh-huh, which is much more, hey, what does that really mean? Uh-huh. Um, so, so very important. Those are just some of the ways that you can, can read cues in other people. Wonderful. Now we all want to positively influence other people. I think we all have this dream that we could just walk into a room and, and positively, you know, impact and influence everybody in the room. Um, so give us some tips. How can we positively influence other people by changing the way that we interact with them? Okay. Uh, the ability to successfully interact with other people builds on your awareness of others, of course, of their emotions. An individual who is strong in this dimension, the interaction with others, utilizes that awareness to build strong relationships, teams, and support networks, which will be important throughout your life. I'm sure you already realize that relationships, of course, are very important, uh, whether it's with uh, teachers or peers or family members. Teams, you'll have, you'll have some of that in college, but there'll be much more as you get out into the work world. That has been building over the years. Uh, people didn't used to work so much in teams, but of course now it's very important. And support networks. This is important from cradle to grave. Um, I've been out of college for quite a long time and I still very much need my support networks. Uh, a lot of that is my family, but it's my friends uh, and, and other people I work with. We always need support networks. And so relationships are going to be such important. So what does that mean? A lot of it has to do with empathy and compassion. Again, my, my, my passion is, is to build these things in the world. Um, this could be a very large subject. Empathy is a really, and, and compassion are really dear to my heart. But just to go quickly through some ways that you can build empathy and compassion in yourself. One, consciously build relationships by asking others to join you. Don't wait for them. Don't wait for something to come up. Consciously do this yourself. Uh, to join in activities, ask somebody to go to lunch, uh, a golf game, go to a poetry reading, do a barbecue. It, it takes conscious effort. Share pictures of your family and encourage others to do the same. Uh, this is so easy now with our iPhones. This was not always true, but you can do that easily and you probably already do that one. Observe, and I love this one, observe how a good role model handles difficult interpersonal situations and experiment with her technique. You're at a meeting, somebody brings up something contentious and you can see there's tension in the room and this person is kind of loud and you know, how does somebody, could be the leader, but it could be somebody else, kind of calm that person down, not make a judgment, kind of speak rationally to him or her, whatever it is that they do, watch that person. You can learn so much from simply watching a good role model in, in many situations. Listen without judging as you plan a project or uh, with others. So uh, you probably have projects that you have to work on together. Um, often you come in with, this is how we should do it, and, you know, if you can keep yourself open to whatever anyone else says, that will help you build a relationship. Uh, at least acknowledge, well, you know, I don't like that part, but I really think this thing that you said could really be helpful. Let's try to build that in. Um, really acknowledging uh, other people will help you build relationships. Um, 
Become a role model for the kind of behavior you want to see in your family or team or organization. Um, if you can become a role model and think of yourself as a role model, you will be a little bit more careful about what you're doing, like especially as a, a parent with children, but even in any team in your, in your college organization. Uh, am I being a role model here when I speak up in this meeting, whether I'm a leader or not? So I have a few more of those, but I, I think that will give you a good, a good start. That's fantastic. Now, resiliency is another really important thing for us to talk about, especially during the pandemic. I mean, I really believe that uh, students are going to be successful over their careers, depending on their resiliency. It's not necessarily who's the smartest in the room. Question is, who's going to get back up after they get knocked down? And Lord knows I've been knocked down a million times in my career. So the question becomes, how can we build and maintain resilience despite all of the stress that's in our lives right now? Okay, very good question. I, I'd like to read a quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. I read it when I was a teenager in Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. When he was a teenager, he survived a, a Nazi concentration camp. He became a very famous psychoanalyst, a philosopher, and uh, he said this. This is kind of the 30,000 foot level from, for resilience. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing. Uh, I can hardly read my own writing. Uh, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's own attitude in any set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So the mindset, the idea that you get to choose your reaction, no matter what has happened to you, no matter how mean someone has been, no matter how ill you are, you get to choose your reaction. Okay, another key, now we're coming down from the 30,000 foot level here, but a key for me is lifelong learning. Uh, the more you can learn from any situation is a key to resiliency at any age. Um, and so I'd like to challenge your audience to learn or do something new every week. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that at the end of this, but here's a little list. First, learn to embrace challenges. Challenges is a nice word for problems, things that come up, embrace those including what I call ULEs, un, un, uh, uh, ULEs, unexpected life events, like getting a, a terrible illness or winning the lottery. We don't, we don't need so much help with those, but we do actually, but there are many unexpected life events, accidents, uh, people dropping off for one reason or another from your support group. Um, we do have those that come up getting very ill. So, as you look at any challenge that comes up this week, uh, small or big, think of it as something you can learn from. It will build resilience. Second, observe the natural world with all your senses. Uh, go, uh, go out into the world and observe things closely. I love trees and I know the names of many trees. I planted 30 species of trees uh, in my yard uh, when I lived on Bainbridge Island. Oh, oh how I hated to leave them. They were like children. But knowing the names of trees and being able to walk and say, oh, there's a mesquite, there's a weeping willow, helps you really appreciate it more. Uh, same with birds. I have birds that come to my balcony. I'm on the third floor. Uh, I know the birds who come and that I get to see. Um, third, seek to understand how something works, no matter what it is, another person, a, a machine, whatever, and be curious. This can help to build your resilience. Just be curious. Don't be angry. Don't dismiss it. Be more curious. Diane Kuchu, who's at Harvard University, talks about resilience of, for people and organizations needing three things. First, accept the reality of what's happened. Second, uh, uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of missing something here. Oh, retain the sense that life is still meaningful. And you must find that in yourself, of course. Now, she says that you don't have to have all of these things, um, but you do need to have them for, for your own resilience. Uh, my next uh, tip is simply to read. Okay, I'm an English professor. I have read thousands of books in my life. Uh, and I, I'm not talking just about nonfiction, which is wonderful, but I'm talking about novels. Uh, because you can learn so much about life and facing difficult situations and learning more about empathy and resilience from reading novels. 
You can travel to a tropical island. You can travel backwards in time. Uh, you can travel to a distant planet light years from now. You can put yourself anywhere and learn so much. Fifth, interact with people and animals too. Again, stretch yourself to interact with people outside of your bubble. How can you find that? There's lots of ways to get outside of your bubble. All you need to do is look for it. And animals too, animals can teach you a lot. Uh, and finally, and this is what I started with, do something you've never done before or do it differently. It could be as simple as driving to work or to school in a, on a different pathway, um, but it, it, could be, it could be much more than that. Learning something totally new or something that you once had an interest in and, and now you can go back to it. So I challenge you, get out your calendar for the new year, try to do something new, learn or do something new every week. That's great advice. I firmly believe in that to stretch yourself a little bit uh, and do something that scares you a little bit because I think that's how we grow, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's fantastic. I did want to ask you one more question because I know that you deal with cyber bullying um, and bullying in general. That seems to be something that you certainly know. Um, and it's on the rise right now on college campuses with some of these anonymous apps that are out there. The one that I'm thinking of is called Yik Yak on college campuses. So what can somebody do, a student, if they are a victim of cyber bullying? Okay. I, I'm not an expert on cyber bullying, but I've been looking into it a lot lately for a, another group. I've also written this book just out this past July. You can choose your own life, stories for decision making. This one is for middle school kids who just as much as any of us need uh, training in this particular area. There are different rules in different states, but basically my advice is cyberbullying is still bullying. That's the name of the chapter of one of these stories. In other words, the, the basic rules still apply. And help me, Michael, you uh, talked about bystander intervention. Intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's still the, the same very important thing that you stand up to the bully in some way. However, I would really urge you uh, to get help, especially if there's emotional or physical uh, uh, problems with what's, what's, with what's happening. So that can be going to your college authorities. It can be from the police if necessary. Again, there are different rules, but in any case, don't let it shame you. Don't keep it to yourself and find a trusted person to help you. Great advice. Fantastic. Now, we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast, and I know you're out on the West Coast with some fantastic food in the state of California. There's no shortage of good food in your area. What's your favorite restaurant these days? Okay, this is a, a very low-key restaurant. I'm more into ambiance than I am food. I know for a foodie, that's just hard to believe. <laughs> I love to go to good stuff restaurants. There's actually two of them, but one is right on the beach in Hermosa Beach. Hermosa. I can watch the dogs, the people, the bicyclists go by, see the ocean, watch the gulls. I mean, it is just a wonderful place. Uh, and of course they have great California food. I love brunch. That's another thing. I just think it's a wonderful idea to combine breakfast and lunch. And I would usually get like a California omelet that of course includes fresh avocados and sour cream and maybe a little guacamole as well. Uh, it also has bacon in it. I'm a vegetarian. I don't think the bacon, it still is delicious. So good stuff restaurants it would be my favorite restaurant here, even That's though we have many, a huge array of restaurants. You really do have a huge array of restaurants to choose from, but I also miss that. I mean, living in uh, in Nashville, being landlocked uh, after really growing up in New York and, and kind of being on some of the best beaches on Long Island, for example, and being able to have dinner uh, out on the, uh, the East Coast by the water, I certainly know what you mean. Uh, there's nothing quite like having a meal uh, right by the ocean. There's really nothing like it. So uh, I envy you there, and I will definitely go and check that out next time I'm in in the area. So if our student listeners, if they want to bring you in, maybe to speak on their campus, maybe they want to get more information about your books, where is the best place for them to go and to connect with you? Okay, so for my books, Amazon is, is the place that both in print and e, e uh, Kindle books. Um, if you would like to enroll in my course, either on demand or when I happen to be facilitating, uh, which comes up from time to time, you need to go to uh, www.charterforcompassion.org. And it's a little hard to find your way to their 
institute, the education institute, but I, I bet you're better at it than I am. So, you know, just click your way through to the education courses and you will find me. Um, uh, is it okay to give out my, um, okay, my email? Oh, sorry, Absolutely. It's K-E-R-R -R at Bainbridge.net. That stands for the island I lived on, B-A-I-N bridge.net. Fantastic. Okay. That is great. Thank you so much, Dr. Curry. It was just fantastic to meet you, talk to you a little bit more about emotional intelligence. I knew right away you were the authority here on this topic. So I'm so glad that you were able to share that with our college student listeners. It's so important and it's so important for their own leadership, for their own success to understand all of these concepts that you laid out here for us today. Thanks, so Mike. And I am grateful to you for reaching out to the college audience with empathy and compassion. I am just floored by what you are doing it's wonderful oh, it's so critical i mean if we just had empathy and compassion for others then all of these headlines that i'm reading about all of these horrific things happening on college campuses would go away because we would just care about each other and, and our health and safety right and so that's really you know something that i think is so critical but with the use of social media and other things you know the tables have turned quite a bit and we're a little bit more inward looking as opposed to you know out we're looking and showing compassion for other people sometimes and then we get into these really sticky situations so i hope and, and pray that uh, the students will listen to your words uh will get your workbook and start working on some of these skills i think it's fantastic so you. if you are a listener and you enjoyed this conversation please like it please share it with other college students and we hope to see you on another episode of fraternity foodie thanks so much and we'll see you soon